been studying Jungian psychology for uh, 33 years. And the purpose of this session is to do a very basic talk about Jungian psychology and what its significance is. And then uh, to read an article, an essay by Dr. Thomas Arst. And I'll explain why that's important in a moment. Uh, Nicole, did you want to say something? Uh, the first few things I want to talk about is, um, first of all, um, Dr. Jung's The Red Book. Okay, this is, a, this is a basic book that relates back to a time in Dr. Jung's life when he was feeling, he was feeling traumatized. He was in his midlife crisis and he had been a psychiatrist for about um, more than 10 years. And he had been the crown prince of Sigmund Freud, but he broke with Sigmund Freud in 1913. And he went into a five-year period, a traumatic period in which he decided to experiment on his own psyche. And it was his, as he said, it was his most difficult experiment because he wanted to experience for himself what the issues were. And so that experience is contained here. And that experience was hidden from the public uh, from 1913 until 2009. Um, and because it was Dr. Jung's active imagination, you can think of active imagination is a waking dream. And so we had a question earlier about someone wanting to experience what it's like to be a black person or what it's like to be a bird or so on. So this would be something like that in the sense that um, Dr. Jung put himself in a, in a dreamlike state by going into his own unconscious by meditation. And in that state, he had many experiences which he recounted in, <clears throat> in the Red Book. Now, even Jungian analysts until 2009 did not have access to the Red Book, so they didn't really know what it was about. And so Jungian psychology as a, as a discipline developed without the Red Book. And it was only in 2009, 48 years after Dr. Jung's death, that um, a man in the UK, Sono Sham Dasani, um, did a produce or published a translation of the Red Book, including all of the images in it. And that profoundly changed Jungian psychology when he did that. Now, um, since 2016, there has been a series of books called Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. And it was edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst. Now there are now four volumes of this series. There is going to be a fifth at least. And uh, Thomas Arst, who was my friend, unfortunately he died on April the 12th of this year but Thomas Ars wrote the very first essay in this book. And uh, when I read it, I found it profound, okay? And so the purpose of this um, session is to give you some idea of what is in this essay. And first, I have to give you a very quick understanding of a, a eagle's eye view of what Jungian psychology is about. And the fundamental thing that it is about is the difference between um, logos and eros. 
or rationalism and irrationalism. So in the Red Book, Dr. Jung begins the Red Book by saying that he had to put rationalism aside. So I'm just going to read the first two paragraphs of the Red Book just to set the stage for what we're going to be talking about. So um, this is quoting from the Red Book, the first two paragraphs. If I speak in the spirit of this time, I must say no one and nothing can justify what I must proclaim to you. Justification is superfluous to me. Since I have no choice, but I must, I have learned that in addition to the spirit of this time, there is still another spirit at work, namely that which rules the depths of everything contemporary. The spirit of this time would like to hear of use and value. I also thought this way, and my humanity still thinks this way, but that other spirit forces me nevertheless to speak beyond justification, use, and meaning. Filled with human pride and blinded by the presumptuous spirit of the times, I long sought to hold that other spirit away from me. But I did not consider that the spirit of the depths from time immemorial and for all the future possesses a great power, or possesses a greater power than the spirit of this time, who changes with the generations. The spirit of the depths has subjugated all pride and arrogance to the power of judgment. He took away my belief in science. He robbed me of the joy of explaining and ordering things, and he let devotion to the ideals of this time die out to me. He forced me down to the last and simplest things. The spirit of the depths took my understanding and all my knowledge and placed them at the service of the inexplicable and the paradoxical. He robbed me of speech and writing for everything that was not in his service, namely the melting together of sense and nonsense, which produces the supreme meaning. Okay, so that's the first two, two paragraphs of the Red Book. And let me, I'm going to share my screen for a couple of minutes and show you some very simple uh, ideas here. Uh, let's see, where is my PowerPoint? Okay, so you should be seeing my PowerPoint now. And <clears throat> so the first idea <clears throat> is Logos and <clears throat> Eros, which is rationality versus irrationality. <clears throat> now, uh, you may think that rationality is everything. And of course, Dr. Jung was saying in that first two paragraphs that he thought that too, and he still wants to think that too. But the problem is that Logos is not alive. Okay, now Matt, take a look at everything in your room, wherever you are, just look around your room. And with the exception of human beings and potted plants, <clears throat> none of that is alive. Okay. Now, we need logos. We need logos 100% because everything that you can see in your room, other than the living things, um, was created perfectly. You wouldn't have it if it wasn't built perfectly. There were plans. There were, you know, um, typesetting, whatever it was, even the computer that you're looking at at this moment, everything was built perfectly. And so we need logos because logos is that thing which is in the scientific method, of course, which allows us to put things together and to do it perfectly. Okay, now the problem, <clears throat> The problem with that is none of it is alive. Okay, none of it. Okay. And so uh, if you think of the I Ching as an example, let me go to my next slide here. 
okay if we if we think of the I Ching as an example or uh, first of all the the same idea is in e equals mc squared okay this fundamental um, equation of Albert Einstein okay so everything in the universe is in constant change everything and it's either mass or it's energy and so if you look out in the universe right now at, you will see planets um, and they hold together and by science we can say a lot of things about that those planets but nowhere else in the universe so far have we found any any form of life it's all dead okay it's just mass except that the stars are changing <laughs> okay the stars are are converting mass into energy and um, and then by some miracle on this planet, the planet where we live, energy or mass somehow by collisions of various things created um, energy that turned into life and was reproducible. And that's why we exist. Okay, so it's, think of the I Ching as an example. If you have a book of the I Ching, that book is just a mass. It has, um, it is perfect. It reproduces what Lao Tzu said 5,000 years ago, perhaps. Um, and it is perfectly formed. But as long as it's on your shelf, it's not a living thing, it's dead. But if you pick up the I Ching, then if you do uh, a divination based on the I Ching, you throw the joysticks or you flip the coins. And if you do that, then suddenly it comes to life, to life because the synchronicities that are, that are contained in the I Ching um, are living things within all of us. And this is what the great Chinese sages thousands of years ago figured out. Okay, so the I Ching as a book is logos. It, you have a perfect example of the I Ching perhaps on your, on your shelf. And uh, as long as it's on your shelf, it's, it's only mass, it's stored energy. In fact, any book that's on your shelf is only stored energy. It's nothing, it's just a mass, but when when you put life into it by reading it, then you have energy produced. Okay, so also related to this is the difference between knowledge and experience. You can explain to a child anything you want about a hot stove and they will not understand it. But if they touch the hot stove, now they have experience. And that's ineffable. Once they've touched the hot stove, they know the stove, they know what hot means, but you cannot describe it by logos. If you read them a, a dictionary definition down to the smallest detail about the word hot, they will not get it. But when they touch the stove, now they know what hot is. And, and so this, that's the difference between logos and eros. Okay, and it's the difference between E equals MC squared. We put energy into these things. Okay, now, here's the thing. A lot of people believe in materialism, which is based on um, logos. And this motor yacht, which I often show people, is a perfect example of this idea. This motor yacht is a 64-foot motor yacht. Now, presumably this owner um, owned other smaller yachts before he got to a 64 footer like this. It's quite a beautiful boat, but he named it perfectly because the point about materialism is it's never enough. Okay, in other words, 
if you live your life based on a materialistic approach, then you're living your life for, for dead things, okay? It's not for your life. And so as you see in this picture, this boat isn't alive. It's sitting at the, at the dock and it's dead. And the owner knows that it, there will never be enough that he may want to have a bigger boat and a bigger boat, but it won't change his fundamental emptiness of his life unless he goes and takes the boat out into whatever body of water, then it's alive, but it's only alive because of the living beings on that boat. It's not alive because of the thing. Having a thing, you can never have enough, right? Okay, so now in, uh, again, in Jungian psychology, in the logos, that is about perfection. And so, as I said, in your room, everything that you have was made perfectly. If it wasn't made perfectly, you wouldn't have bought it. It wouldn't be there. But Jungian psychology is about wholeness, about being, uh, to live, it, live a complete life, a, an example of a good life. And so that, um, in um, so the basic idea in Jungian psychology is individuation. Now, what that means is being all you can be, learning to live a full a full life. Okay, so uh, every living being uh, strives for wholeness. Mother Nature makes us all strive for wholeness. And uh, so if we take an oak tree, for example, um, if it, every oak tree is the same in certain characteristics, but every oak tree is different, every single one of them. And so it is with us as well. All of us human beings contain certain characteristics which are common to all human beings but we're all different, every single one of us. So uh, individuation is about making yourself whole in the context of whatever you are, wherever you are, however you are. And, and so an oak tree, if it loses a limb, it still keeps on living and it just pushes up in a different way. And so it is with human beings. If we lose something that we want or have, and it's something wonderful, then and then we lose that and we don't have that anymore. Um, you know, it might be a spouse, it might be a home, whatever it is. If we lose those things, our nature makes us want to go out and <laughs> move on with life and be everything we can be still. And so we, we end up changing and becoming different. So one example that I have provided here um, in uh, Zhongguo Zi is uh, the Chongqing earthquake. Now in that case, um, there was a terrible earthquake in Chongqing in Chongqing in China. And in that case, many lives were lost. Uh, apartment buildings collapsed and so on. So those lives were terribly lost and, and very unfortunate. <clears throat> but the people who survived that earthquake then had to go on and build something else. So they couldn't go on with the building that they were living in. So they had to build something new. So it is with all of us. If we have a trauma or something goes wrong in our lives, we have to learn, we have to know how to build out and do something new. And so that's how it is with me right here now in this discussion that I'm talking, I'm talking about Dr. Young's work. Um, 
my my life has had a number of things that have stopped caused me stopped something i was doing and changed my life entirely many times so it's like uh, a, a branch grew out here, it got cut off. So then I grew out of a branch here, it got cut off. And a branch here, it got cut off. But still I keep building branches. And I kept doing that until my experience taught me that what Dr. Jung was teaching me represented my wholeness in a way. And that therefore I'm here offering this class right now. And so that's what individuation is about. Now, one of the ideas that Dr. Jung talked about was the 2 million year old man, but it's actually a 3.5 billion year old man, okay? Because in nature, all of our ancestors, all of them, of every one of us, uh, all of our ancestors going back to single celled organisms, have done two things successfully. They have survived until they reproduced. They have survived until they reproduced. And what caused them to, to survive was not knowledge, it was instinct, okay? And so all of us have that. And what individuation is about is calling up that spirit of the depths that that essence of hu every human life, which tells us what we should be doing. And that was Dr. Jung's experience. And, um, and so what we have to do is we have to learn how to call upon that. Okay, now I'm gonna stop this share. I hope that is helpful as an overview. And oops, I have one more person that wants to come in. So they're here. And um, okay, so I, I want to mention one other thing very quickly. Uh, these ideas are very old. So um, there is a series of tantric sutras um, that had their origin in early Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, and uh, there's a man named Lauren Roche who has written a series of poems that relate to those sutras. And in the beginning of his book, in his preface uh, or his prelude, he uh, has a paragraph that's very significant. So I wanna share that paragraph with you. He says, the Bhareva Tantra is set as a conversation between the goddess who is creative power of the universe and the God who is the consciousness that permeates everywhere. For that, for short, they call each other Devi and Bhareva, Shakti and Shiva they are lovers and inseparable partners. And one of their favorite places of dwelling is in the human heart. Now, the significance of that is, again, think of E equals MC squared. Okay, the creative power is energy and consciousness or physical existence is is mass, okay? E equals mc squared has means exactly the same as what he's talking about. And so I'll just read one of these. Um, uh, I'll just read one of these sutras as he's translated it, just so you have an appreciation. So I'm reading from the Radiant Sutras uh, by Lauren Roach, and it's a uh, it's a poetic interpretation of the Vijnana Bhareva Tantras. The roar of joy that set the worlds in motion is reverberating in your body and the space between all bodies. Beloved, listen. Find that exuberant vibration rising new in every moment 
humming in your secret places, resounding through the channels of delight. Know you are flooded by, its, by it always. Float with the sound, melt with it into divine silence. The sacred power of space will carry you into the dancing radiant emptiness that is the source of all. The ocean of sound is inviting you into its spacious embrace, calling you home. Okay, so the point is that in this E equals MC squared, even the mass is connected atoms, as a famous US TV physicist has it. Every atom in the universe is connected to every other atom in the universe. And so there is this constant interplay between mass and energy. And so, okay, uh, Simon has a question. So go ahead, Simon. Oh, uh, no, no, I no, no, no question, uh, Mr. Connell. Connell? Yes. Connell, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, just uh, my limited English. No, uh, how to say, uh, yeah, it's a uh, good or that, that, that's uh, uh, there's, there's a scientist, uh, good or. Whether he said the, the mass, mathematics is not uh, perfect. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not good at, uh, at the science and the uh, technology. I just uh, heard of that theory. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm, uh, Gooder said uh, he has some, mm, so, uh, uh, some theories and mm -hmm. uh, very, very influenced. And uh, he said the uh, mathematics is not a perfect thing. And uh, uh, well, let's, I, I, let's put it this way. It's not complete. Okay. I mean, if you ask well, a math, if you ma ask a mathematician if, if math is perfect, mm -hmm. they will say, yes, it's perfect. The pro and that's logos. That's what logos would say. That's what the scientific method would say. The problem mm. is, it's not alive. Okay. Oh. Mm -mm. Okay. That's the point. And okay. all right. So um, now I want to read this essay, but I need to take a short break. So I'm going to excuse myself for a moment. I will be right back. And if you want to have a conversation among you for one minute, please do that. I'll be right back. Hey, is it Yuan? Yuan? This has never happened before. Hope <laughs> it goes away. Unusual.
Okay, sorry. So that is a, a um, real life example of exactly my point. Okay, as much as I'd like to have a perfect session today with everybody interacting and everything perfect, um, still nature rules my life. And so um, I'm forced to respond to nature's call in order to be able to continue with my lecture. And, and so that's a physical example. Uh, so uh, Redmi, uh, did you have a question? It was nice to see you anyway. Um, okay, so uh, Dr. Ars essay is quite profound and I'm going to take it slowly uh, if there are questions or comments on it uh, because I have um, many listeners here who may um, <clears throat> have difficulty with English. I'm going to take it fairly uh, slowly and try to cover after each paragraph the concepts that are being covered. And so uh, Dr. Thomas Arst uh, was a physicist actually uh, who lived in Germany. Unfortunately, he died on April the 12th of this year. And so in part, and he was the uh, co-editor of this series of books called Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. And so um, this reading of his essay is in part a memoriam to him. So um, he, he begins by quoting Dr. Jung, he says, our age is seeking a new spring of life. I found one and drank of it, and the water tasted good. Now, what Dr. Jung is talking about there in that quote is the spring of life that comes from the deep unconscious. So when he talks about the spirit of this time and the spirit of the depths, the spirit of this time is that spirit which pushes us back and forth through our politics and everything that's going on in our lives. We're, we're pushed from one side to the other constantly. Um, but there's another spirit at work and that spirit is the spirit of the depths, which is this 2 million year old man that I mentioned earlier, okay, which has developed and that spirit of the depths has kept all of your ancestors alive all the way back to single celled organisms long enough so that they reproduced. Okay, so that's true of every single one of us. All of our ancestors survived until they reproduced. So they had a natural something that kept them going uh, in, in their nature. And you were the result of that. All of us are the result of that. All right, so Dr. Young's, or Dr. Arst's essay begins. A specter haunts our world today. Its name is angst, small wonder. As former German Secretary of State Frank Walter Steinmeier recently remarked, the world is out of joint. At the same time, German diplomats diplomats such as Wolfgang Ischinger have noted that the disintegration of international security structures has accelerated and that decision makers in politics and business are overrun by unexpected events on a daily basis. Diagnosticians of our times like German philosopher Peter Schlotterdick see the world plunging forward the World Economic Forum's Global Risks Report 2017 identifies a hazardous, hazardous planetary risk landscape that does not invite for much cheerfulness and serenity. Uh, one other person. Okay. 
Our present age, which we may call post-modernity, is characterized by an overwhelming amount of fluidity and volatility on a global scale, as well as on the level of everyday lives of individuals. Cynical contemporaries even speak of a racing standstill. Although nothing remains the same, nothing substantial does in fact change, even if we cannot yet see the direction in which this unbridled fast train engine called globalization will take us. Today's world is obviously undergoing historical transformations that are probably unique in size and scale. If only this will work out well in the long run, as Napoleon's mother remarked while witnessing the coronation of her son. And so that's the first paragraph. And so what Dr. Arst is introducing us to first is the idea of uh, post-modernity, uh, which uh, is defined further later in this essay. But what he's talking about is that we find ourselves awash in information, for example, and that has become quite complicated for us in our lives. <clears throat> um, and so we all need to learn how to deal with that. And keep in mind that this is very unusual. I mean, there's a statistic that I've read that says that the average man of the 16th century, so uh, 400 or 500 years ago, only was exposed to as much information as one issue, one edition of the US New York Times. And so uh, for those of you who are not in America, uh, the New York Times comes out on Sunday and it's pretty thick. It's a newspaper. It has magazines. It has all kinds of advertisements stuffed in it. And it has comic pages and sports pages and so on. Uh, and so nobody can even read that book because that every or read that issue. So we have to decide what we're going to read. But the point is that the average person five or four or 500 years ago in a whole lifetime was only exposed to that much information. So you had a whole lifetime to understand all that. But now we are exposed to all the information in the world, okay, all the time, seven by 24. So that's what's happening here. Um, we're having a, a Zoom conference in which we're all faced with information that we didn't know before and we have to figure out what to do with it um, and and so that's what the significance of Dr. Young's Red Book because he was faced with also very similar situation and he had to figure out okay what can I as an individual do about all this information that I'm getting Okay, so reading on, I'm going to read a fairly long period or passage here and then come back to it. In fact, there have always been turbulent thrusts, cracks, faults, and societal free feverish states. Contemporary historians usually attribute these to, exclusive, to exclusively to technological change and innovation. For example, if we consider the decade prior to the year 1914, as Philip Blom's work, The Vertigo Years, Change in Culture in the West, 1900 to 1914, impressively shows, we find that the first 14 years of the 20th century saw rapid socioeconomic developments that put the individuals as well as many European societies into a highly agitated state. The spirit of this time, as C.G. Jung referred to it in his Red Book, then led Europeans as, as though sleepwalking into exhausting trench warfare 
and technological mobilization, giving rise to geopolitical realignments. What is disconcerting is Bloom's observation. Okay, now this is a observation that Blum was making over a hundred years ago. Here's what he said. Then as now, rapid changes in technology, globalization, now he was saying this a hundred years ago, again. Then as now, rapid changes in technology, globalization, communication technologies, and changes in the social fabric dominated conversations and newspaper articles. Then as now, cultures of mass consumption stamped their mark on the time. Then as now, the feeling of living in an accelerating world of speeding into the unknown was overwhelming. Okay, so that was the experience already a hundred years ago. The tremors of World War I consequently led to World War II. In our time, total mobilization has reached the planetary level, just one spiral turn higher. Once more, we are disoriented in an epoch of angst. And now 100 years after the age of anxiety, we find ourselves again restless in the age of burnout. Okay, so what Dr. Arnst, Arst is pointing out is that um, human beings have been confused for a long time. In other words, we've been getting more and more information coming into us, and uh, it's hard to know what to do with it. And so what I want to do is point back now to the oak tree, okay, because all of us in our lifetimes face a time of trauma and disorientation. In other words, everybody loses their parents some, uh, at some point. Everybody um, might have a, lose a, a spouse or a sibling who dies. And we have to go on. We have to bring ourselves out of the sadness of that fact and we have to go on. And so the pool, the spring that we have to help us pull ourselves out of that so that we can go on living is within us. It's in our deep unconscious. And so we need to be able to pull that up and call upon those reserves that we all have, um, but many of us don't know how to use them. And, and very often, if you don't know how to use it, it may cause you to be so upset that you might commit suicide or something like that. And of course, that doesn't help you create the meaning of your life at all. So uh, the idea here is that we have springs of life within us, extra reserves that we can call upon to help us deal with, first of all, deal with, integrate what has happened to us and uh, then go on. So if we uh, imagine, suppose we're on a motorcycle and we're in a terrible accident and we lose our arm, our right arm, well, um, you know, that would be a terrible tragedy. But the point is that it's like the oak tree that loses a limb. We then have to um, find within ourselves the ability to push another limb out, to come, out with a, come up with another idea, another way of living. And those springs are within us. We have to learn how to tap those springs. And... And so human beings have been facing this same sort of issue for a very long time. This is Dr. Ars' point in that paragraph. Now, let me read on. Artists and sensitive contemporaries who lived between the years 1880 and 1914, such as the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, 
intuited the seismographic shift that was about to come. Bewildered by societal developments and generational world weariness, trapped in the pr prison of reason. Okay, trapped in the prison of reason. Remember I was talking about um, the reason, the rational, none of it is alive. So trapped in the prison of reason and yearning for an absent meaning, the best minds look for new ways out of the spiritual malaise of their time. Dadaist Hugo Ball described the collective condition of his generation as follows, quote, the world and society in 1913 looked like this. Life is completely confined and shackled. A kind of economic fatalism prevails. Each individual, whether he resists it or not, is assigned a specific role and with it, his interests and his character. The church is regarded as a redemption factory of little importance. Literature as a safety valve, the most burning questions day and night, it, the most burning question day and night is, is there anywhere a force that is strong enough to put an end to this state of affairs? And if not, how can we escape it? Okay, so again, this is a um, hundred years ago and Hugo Ball is talking about the church being redemption factories, but of little importance. And so people are just zoning out. In those days, it was zoning out on literature. It was before there was even radio, let alone television and certainly let alone uh, the internet and the ability to have a conference like this across the world. And so that's, you know, that's the way it has been for a long time. And so we have to find another reserve, another way of uh, finding the meaning of our lives. This is what uh, Jungian psychology is about. This is what individuation is about, but you have to have it by experience. Okay, so uh, Dr. Ars goes on. God is dead, as Nietzsche announced, and the iron cage of modernity was in the meantime, having turned into an omnipresent digitalized gestell, rigidly established. Contemporaries sense the severe implications of the erosion of the Christian myth, not to be at home in one's own time anymore. Then as now, the collective situation forced the search for transcendence and meaning in order to withstand the undertow of the postmodern chaos that has undoubtedly revealed a nihilistic character or signature. Okay, so, um, his point is that if we do everything on a logos basis, um, eventually we come to a dead end. Okay, in other words, um, and, and what used to give meaning to people's lives uh, in, in the West, it was uh, religion and Christianity especially, what gave meaning to their lives, um, that has eroded. Now, how did it erode? So over the past 500 years, the scientific method has disproved all the things that the, all the stories, the narratives that the church was selling for the previous 1500 years in Christianity. And so, um, and the church was trying to stop any change. And so in 1519, Galileo had his telescope and even before him, others, Copernicus and others, and they looked through a telescope and they said, uh, wait a minute, there's no God up there. And so new and God had been selling God up there for 1500 years. And so 
over the last 500 years then through the scientific method, uh, the Christian myth that all the narratives and stories of Christianity have been proven untrue in the physical world, okay? However, all religions are a kind of psychotherapy. And so they were not un untrue in the psyche, in the psychic world, but people lost contact between the physical world and the unconscious world because we, they didn't understand it anymore. And all the scientists were selling, um, you know, this is the facts, these are the truths. Um, you have to pay attention to this. The only thing to do is go, go, go and, and get material things. But that leads to a dead end as the motor yacht that I showed earlier in this discussion um, demonstrated. I mean, there, what good is that motor yacht is if it's sitting at the, at the pier and the owner knows it, he says, never enough, there's not enough. I might, you know, will I be happy if I have a bigger yacht? You know, I, I'll ask you a question. The president of the United States right now um, is sort of the poster boy of materialism. He's basically gotten everything he ever wanted in the physical world. And the question is, is he happy? You know, did he find fulfillment or wholeness in life? And I don't know of anybody, but maybe there are some here who would suggest that he has found fulfillment. I don't think so. Okay, so reading on. The Su Swiss psychologist C.G. Jung undertook perhaps the most challenging deep dive to seek answers to the questions posed by the epoch. Alarmed by visions and dreams which reflected the tensions of his era and presaged the coming world war, Jung daring, daringly searched for his soul in an experiment to learn his personal myth. After the descent, Jung not only formulated his own myth, but was also able to suggest the framework for a new collective myth. As will be illustrated later, Jung's red book, Liber Novus, is both a highly intimate testimonial and a reference to the framework of this new collective myth. Now the new myth um, is really the idea of individuation, okay? In other words, the idea that all living creatures <clears throat> have within us the ability to become whole, to live a complete life, a satisfying life, a happy life. And no matter what happens to us, something within us will open a, a new way of looking at life. And, um, you know, for Westerners who are familiar with the movie, The Sound of M Music, um, the mother superior says to Maria at one point, um, when God closes a door, he opens a window. And that's the point here, that when something gets shut off in your life so that you can't go forward, then um, you are, something else emerges that can be meaningful to your life and help you live your life. Um, okay, so reading on. Even though the term postmodernity is difficult to define and contains a high degree of ambiguity due to its notorious lack of some conceptual clarity, attempts at diagnostic analysis have shown several general characteristics, such as deconstructionism, radical plurality, arbitrariness, liquidity, fragmentation, decanonization, acceleration, muddling through, increasing complexity, ambiguity, and slippery slopes. In a few sentences, German writer 
Hans Magnus Enzenberger masterfully portrays our contemporary postmodern condition in which the increase of entropy can even be witnessed right in our own backyards. Okay, so now we're getting to the definition of the type of world we're living in, which is now called postmodernism, not modernism, but postmodernism. And let me just point out that the word entropy is the tendency of things to fall apart, the tendency of things to, um, to disintegrate over time and it applies to everything. All right, so this is how um, this other writer, Enzenberger, defines postmodernity. Lower Bavarian market towns, rural villages in the Eiffel, small towns in Holstein are populating themselves with figures that nobody would have considered imaginable just 30 years ago. Golf playing butchers, wives imported from Thailand, undercover intelligence officers in allotment gardens, Turkish mullahs, female pharmacists in Nicaragua committees, Mercedes Benz driving vagabonds, anti-authoritarians with organic gardens, gun collecting tax officers, farmers breeding peacocks, militant lesbians, Tamil ice cream vendors, classical philologists trading co uh, commodity futures, mercenaries at, on home leave, extremist animal rights activists, cocaine dealers with tanning salons, dominatrices with customers from top management, computer freaks commuting commuting between California databases and Hessian wildlife reserve parks, carpenters delivering doors made of gold to Saudi Arabia, art forgers, Karl May scholars, bodyguards, jazz experts, palliative care physicians, and porn producers, the loners and village idiots, weirdos and misfits, all have been replaced by the media mediocre deviant who does not even stick out anymore among the millions of his ilk. So the point is um, postmodernism is uh, very much like the United States. And so I've done a lot of traveling around the world and I used to try to figure out what one factor above all others makes the United States the, the most economically successful country in the world uh, and the strongest in the world from a military perspective. And what I finally came up with is that um, is our diversity and the fact that we allow all voices to speak and whenever, and here in the United States, we have um, people from every country, every language, every religion, every ethnic group, every, um, every culture in the world is represented in our country. And what happens is, and people don't understand that, they look at our politics and they say, oh my God, how can you live in a world like that where there's people just arguing all the time because they look at the cable news and it looks like everything is an argument and they're right. But what happens? What happens is that every time a good idea comes up from any group, from any group, that, uh, that idea gets adopted everywhere, okay? And so, even ideas that most of us say, well, is this such a good idea? An idea like fast food has been a, adopted everywhere. So I've been on Tiananmen Square in Beijing and seen the golden arches on the corner of the square. Okay, the, the McDonald's golden arches, American fast food is there in the very center 
of China. And um, another example is um, Starbucks coffee for $5 a cup instead of it used to be very cheap. To, you know, go to a restaurant and you have a cup of coffee for 25 cents. Well, um, Harold Schultz developed a, co a way of selling coffee for $5 a cup instead of a quarter, but he changed it. He made better coffee. He allowed different ways of presenting it and everybody adopted it. So today you can go anywhere and find a Starbucks anywhere in the world. <clears throat> and so whenever an idea like that, which is a good idea comes up, it gets adopted. And so even leaving a politics aside, I, I know from my own experience that in so Howard Schultz what is known to be a Zionist, okay? That means a person who supports Israel, okay? But nonetheless, notwithstanding the fact that he is, there are four Starbucks restaurants in King Faisal Hospital in the building in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, four of them in that one hospital. And so the point is that whenever a good idea gets adopted, it first gets adopted every place in the United States, and then it gets adopted around the world. And every time a bad idea comes up, um, it gets crushed out of the system. And so um, we were currently seeing uh, the idea of uh, police brutality that ha has come up among a group known as white supremacists in the United States. And so the idea is to really squeeze black people down so that they, they can't move at all. But that idea is a bad idea. And so we're currently seeing that in the United States getting crushed out of the system. And that's what the Black Lives Matter uh, movement is. And so ultimately we will have a balance in policing that's um, not too strong and not too weak, but just right. And it probably was just right, or at least better 50 years ago, but people got an idea that, that uh, they could keep the American black community down by policing very tough on them. <clears throat> and that idea just isn't working anymore. And so we see that change coming. And so my point is in terms of this definition of post-modernity, yes, things are mixed up. I mean, it's a messy approach, but it works. <laughs> it works. And that's the point. Um, and so I was asked on the YouTube sh chat, is that the Carl Jung house behind you? And the answer to that is yes, it's Bollingen. It's a house that Dr. Jung built with his bare hands <clears throat> as a stonemason. And um, it had no electricity and no plumbing in it because he wanted to be able to put himself back into the mind of a 16th century human being before um, all the ideas of modernity, all the, all the ideas of the so-called enlightenment, which was really an endarkenment, um, but the enlightenment presented the scientific method and it changed it changed the way we looked at the world. So um, let's say in the 14th century, the cathedral at Chartres was built. Now, customarily, uh, Chartres or a cathedral in Europe took a hundred years to build. So the people that laid the cornerstone didn't, um, didn't ever see the end result, but it gave meaning to uh, people's lives uh, to 
to build on that because they were building God's house. And so that gave meaning to their lives. And so in those days before the scientific method, uh, people were, had meaning in their lives because they were doing something for God as described by the theologians who had come up for 1500 years. They had meaning to their lives. But in the last 500 years, as the stories of Christianity have been debunked one after another, starting with Galileo um, and Copernicus, uh, because of that, um, people had, had to find other meaning to their lives. And that's what Dr. Young's work is all about, really, finding other, um, other meaning. Uh, and Williver says, there's literally an infinite amount of ways to arrive at the same sum. Each way is true in its path, correct? Uh, and that's the point here. And Okay, uh, going on. Um, <clears throat> so I've just read the, the description of how everything is all jumbled up. I mean, in Europe, what happened after World War II is um, there weren't enough laborers in Germany, for example, so they had to import laborers from Turkey. Now, obviously, when you import laborers from Turkey, um, that's going to change your society quite dramatically. And, um, and so now what Dr. Ars was describing here, what, um, what this author um, Eisenberger was describing was a society that's now all jumbled up much as the United States is. And so that's postmodernism. <clears throat> Now, in one important aspect, and this is the essential point with regard to Jung's Red Book, the diagnoses of our time appear to converge. There is, according to French philosopher and sociologist Jean-Francois Lyotard, himself a disappointed Marxist by his own admission, no major meaningful and integrative meta-narrative anymore, no grand narrative that is able to impart an all-encompassing conception of humankind's role in the world. For any grand narrative, such as is offered, for example, by the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Bible, the Odyssey, the Enlightenment, the belief in science or Marxism, the following postmodern analysis applies. Quote, simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern as incredulity toward meta-narratives. This incredulity is undoubtedly a product of progress in the sciences, but that progress in turn presupposes it. To the obs obsolescence of the meta-narrative, apparatus of legitimation corresponds, most notably, the crisis of metaphysical philosophy and of the university institution in the past relied on it. The narrative function is losing its functors, its great hero, its great dangers, its great voyages, its great goal. It is being dispersed in clouds of narrative language, narrative, but also denotative, prescriptive, descriptive, and so on. Conveyed within each cloud are pragmatic valencies specific to the, its kind. Each of us lives at the intersection of many of these. So the point is that all the great stories that human beings lived by in the past who were um, theologians or what have you, or people who were living under the theologians, we had this story about God, God being up there, God coming to us. And so Europeans in this 14th century 
could spend generations building on the Cathedral of Chartres or the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, the one that's recently burned down. And that gave, gave great meaning to their lives. But now all of that, everyone is cynical. Okay, everyone says, oh, that's not true. Or, oh no, I'm gonna do this instead of that. And that sort of thing. And so what is the great narrative? Okay, so a couple of things that Dr. Young had in mind. One was this idea that each individual must individuate. In other words, each of us must become all we can be. And each one of us is different. So each of us owns a tile in the great mosaic of life. Now, what is that great mosaic of life? Well, Dr. Jung felt um, that we are becoming, uh, we are becoming the incarnation of God. In other words, we ourselves as human beings are God um, and we are the consciousness of God. In other words, God was, um, what, what he says later in this essay, which I'll get to at some point, it might be a couple of weeks from now, the real history of the world seems to be the progressive incarnation of the deity. So the point that he is making is that God, if God was conscious, God would, had a pretty dim consciousness because it took hundreds of millions of years to develop all these species that we have. We have 8 million species on the planet. And each one of them took millions, if not billions of years to develop. If we go back to the beginning of life on earth, that's three and a half billion years ago. <clears throat> and each and every one of us listening to this conversation right now is descended from single celled organisms. So once again, all of us are descended by millions from millions of ancestors, all of which did two things successfully. They survived until they reproduce. That's what they did. And most of those creatures don't know that they're alive. They just do what they always did. If you look at fish in the sea, the, you know, this species of fish always did this and this species of fish always did that. And that's how they survived. And um, rabbits became faster and faster to outrun the eagles and the eagles get, got better and better eyesight so that they could catch the rabbits faster. And that was evolution. <clears throat> so all of us are part of that development, but what didn't develop was <clears throat> what we think of as human consciousness. And that only came with us. So it's only through <clears throat> human beings that we even conceptualize God, okay? Um, and, you know, that we can even save our concepts into the next generation so that we can have books and teach our young based on what others have been through before. We can teach them from books. We can teach them from communicate, by communicating now through the internet. We can now have Zoom calls across the world and, um, you know, that all came with human beings and that's consciousness and what, and so what Dr. Jung is saying is that God, while God exists everywhere, God also has consciousness through us. And so it is up to us to decide what God wants, okay? Think of it that, you can think of it that way. Um, 
All right. So all of us live at this intersection of all these different narratives, but in the end, it all comes down to that, to individuation and to what the meaning of consciousness is, what the meaning of life is, what the meaning of our life is, what our little tile in the great mosaic of life is going to be. What are What is our contribution going to be? Okay, so he goes on. Ars goes on. From a spiritual point of view, the horizon of meaning offered by a divine order, the great order of being, is seemingly lost, while from the perspective of the postmodern subject, the world as well as life itself is not readable, understandable, or shapeable anymore. Whereas prior epics had a meaningful grand narrative, here, Dante's Divine Comedy, Wolfgang, uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's Faust, and Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra come to mind. The modern or postmodern man is left without a timely, central, and vivid myth. In Edward Edinger's estimation, this condition of spiritual and metaphysical homelessness, a state of being perhaps best captured by Nietzsche's The Last Man or Martin Heidegger's They has only deepened in later times. <clears throat> so now he's quoting Edinger. It is, evident, it is evident to thoughtful people that Western society no longer has a viable functioning myth. Indeed, all major world cultures are approaching to a greater or lesser extent the state of mythlessness. The breakdown of a central myth is like the shattering of a vessel containing a precious essence. Meaning is lost. And so <clears throat> where this is leading, where this essay is leading, is that the traditional meanings, whether it was uh, the meaning presented by the Bible or the meaning presented by Mao Zedong's Little Red Book, um, all that is changing. And, but interestingly, uh, what I learned more than 50 years ago is that things really don't change that much because I, for my senior thesis in college, I wrote a paper where I compared Confucian thought to Mao Zedong's Little Red Book, and I found huge parallels, okay? Mao's Little Red Book and Confucian thought basically are saying the same things. So even though we think things have changed, they haven't changed all that much. And so, but what Jung's point is, is that the myth for our time uh, the myth that we can live by is the lit myth of individuation. Instead of myth, uh, think of narrative or the story of an individuation where each of us has unique gifts, unique experiences. Every human diff is different in the sense that every oak tree is different. Every plant of it, whatever species is different. Um, we're all different and we all have something to offer. And it's up to us uh, to be able to look inside as human consciousness and see what it is that our gift is, what we can present to the world. And it isn't somebody else telling you how to live your life. It's you telling you how to live your life. That's what you have to, um, have to see from Jungian psychology. This is what C.G. Jung was talking about, that um, it is only you that is going to live your life, not any government, not any religion, not any specific idea. It is you that has to take whatever information and whatever opportunities you get. You might have been born blind, but if you were born blind, then um, 
you two have gifts. You have a you have a different kind of gift. Let's suppose you were born blind. Well, um, in that case, it means your other senses are more acute typically. So it means that um, you can hear music better. Uh, you can hear the the nuances of music better. So maybe your um, your part in the in the great mosaic of life is to write beautiful symphonies. That could be. Um, Helen Keller was born blind and deaf, and uh, gradually over time, uh, so she couldn't hear, she couldn't see, but she had a teacher who could teach her by um, by experience, okay? That teacher taught her what water was, for example. That was one of the first breakthroughs, was that teacher poured water over her hands and then connected the idea of water with the idea of a word, okay, in Braille. And, um, and so gradually, Helen Keller was able to read and then she, this teacher also taught her to speak. And so uh, by the end of her life, Helen Keller was uh, making profound philosophical statements, even though she had never physically been able to see or be, been able to hear. But because a teacher who, you know, the meaning of that teacher's life was to show what a teacher can do to, with someone, even someone that's severely handicapped. And the meaning of Helen Keller's life was that, that she demonstrated that a person with severe handicap can still make a great contribution to humanity. And so, so yes, we all have our disadvantages. We're all um, stuck in a certain <clears throat> situation in a certain life. Um, for example, I'm 73 years old. I can't change that fact. I'm, you know, my, my life is uh, much closer to the end of it than the beginning uh, because uh, I'm not going to live another 73 years. So um, I'm trying to give meaning to my life by um, helping other people see what I've seen what I've understood so that that can be carried forward in the future. And so that gives my life meaning. Um, and Dr. Jung, obviously in his lifetime, he wrote 20 volumes of his collected works and there are many other writings. My understanding is that there are 35,000 letters that still have not been published of his work. And um, so, he was a huge mind and his life is going to be giving meaning to many of our lives for decades to come, decades, centuries. Um, and some people are like that. And he knew that, he knew that there was a meaning in his life. And so even though he didn't have, a, you know, a thousand fans on YouTube, or anything like that. His circle was very small during his lifetime, only about a couple of dozen people at the most. Um, he has had huge influence around the world and still is having, obviously, because you're sitting here listening to me. So, um, okay. So let's see, it is it's gone almost two hours and I need to see where we're going. Okay, so there's one more point that I wanna make here before we wrap up for today. And this is, this is going to be a series of events all at this hour on Sunday mornings. Um, and Simon has his hand up. Simon, do you have a question? Um, if you have a question, you can ask it. Uh, uh, th uh, thank you, um, uh, 
Thank you, Mister. And、uh, maybe maybe I ask some question at at the end of the speech.、Uh, and、okay. uh, but but because my my problem my my questions are not so concern concern and not so、uh, close to the topic. Okay. All right. So.、Um... Also, it might be possible because we have others here.、Uh, it might be possible if you can't express your question easily in English, someone may be able to translate for you. So please try that、uh, at the end. But I, I will go on because I, I do want to get to one one important point here. <clears throat> okay. So referring back, so I'm going to read on for the moment. Yeah, referring back to Jung's work, Edinger continues as Jung's discovery of his own mythlessness paralleled the mythless condition of modern society. So Jung's discovery of his own individual myth will prove to be the first emergence of our new collective myth. Edinger's statement is only understandable if one puts aside the discourse of academic sociologists, cultural theorists, and professional philosophers, opening up to the sphere of individual core experience, in the sense of Carl Fried Graf Durkheim or Jung's experience of the self. One approaches the psychological. Religious, spiritual, and metaphysical realms of life that are generally thought to be off limits by today's postmodern academic establishment. Nothing causes greater tedium and disregards the central questions of our time more than the ignorance and prevailing bustle witnessed within the self-referential and detail-obsessed chairs of our university institutions. In all likelihood, nothing revelatory will come from their discourse, and so the point here is that universities typically are built in silos. You've got the economics department, the political science department, the religion department, the、uh, languages department, whatever, and they don't communicate. And if they're ruled by a certain school. For example, if the, the theology department is ruled by Christians, then they're only going to talk about Christian things in their silo, and they're not going to hire people who are going to、um, who are going to talk about other things in、um, in religion. And you know, one of the big things that needs to happen in our world. Is that we have to、um, we have to come to a time when our religions can talk with one another, when there can be religious harmony.、And、that means、uh, that that instead of fighting one another, as as all different schools of thought do.、Um, They need to turn toward one another and see what they have in common, and see if wow, this religion has this idea, which we never had in our religion. Maybe we ought to think about that one a little bit. And the other thing we need to do is find a way to have good secular ethics. Okay, so so the problem in In universities, especially in the West, and I can't speak for other parts of the world, but it, certainly in the West, a department will have a specific idea. Like the psychology department may be ruled by Freudians and by people who want to push drugs instead of、uh, actually solving your problem. And so the result of that. Is that we now have in the United States something like seventy thousand people a year dying from drug overdoses, and so that in itself is a problem, and so we have to find ways to help people 
deal with trauma, deal with the issues of their lives um, that don't involve pharmaceuticals. And that can only happen if there's a broad discussion, which is why I'm doing this Zoom session uh, right now so that others in the world um, for whom this hour is better uh, can participate and understand what's being talked about. Okay, so I have read about, uh, let's see. I've read about six pages of a 22 page essay. And so I knew that this was not going to be fast and uh, my voice is starting to give out after two hours. So I will be offering a continuation of this discussion um, every week on Sunday morning at 8 a.m. my time, which supports people like Nicole who lives in Australia. I hope it's late at night for her, but, um, but for some others, it may be a, a decent time. Uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, more of you uh, will be able to join us in the future. And so uh, I will be doing this every week. And so it will be um, eight o'clock, 8 a.m. my time, but 8 p.m. in Singapore, for example, <clears throat> which should be a reasonable time and it will be on Sunday, so it's a reasonable time for many people to be able to hear uh, these lectures. And um, I'm going to start with a continuation of Dr. Arce's essay because it is so profound and it raises a lot of ideas. And then we'll talk about what, how I'm going to do it in the future. So if you do have questions, or comments, uh, Nicole, certainly if you have any thoughts about what we've been talking about, I, I would welcome your inputs. Um, and, okay. Yeah, go ahead. What now? No, um, well, oh, wow. Uh, while you were reading it, I was, I guess what I was doing was trying to get the context of the other people here in China. Right. And I'm a little bit unfamiliar with that. And But also, like, I was just thinking about it and from my own personal, like, what's going on for me and just how I was this weekend out in, in town because mm -hmm. there was... I was out today and there was a lot of people around and it was it was a really different atmosphere and I actually found it really disturbing <laughs> because it's been so quiet and and you know I've got all these Jungian things going on in my mind and and one of the thoughts that came up when I when I noticed that I was disturbed and I was wanting to not be there like because normally I go to town to sort of as an alternative reality to being by myself here and then I but I didn't want to be in either place and I was really like oh god you know like really confronted and um and then I was having a conversation about this with this other person that I met that happened to understand about Jungian concepts and and then I had this feeling of like this whole rabbit hole that I've been in, in this Jungian stuff, like it just keeps rolling with all these complex things and, 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 you know, how to stop it. Like how to, where do, where do, where do we take rest? Where do we, and and the only thing that sort of came through today was was the transcendent function because you can sit with a problem that might be a personal problem or a cultural problem for a really long time and, and sort of 
have it there, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and like it can, and and it can sort of really, it can direct you in different ways, like you were saying. Right. And and you can all, <clears throat> but it can also really impact your psyche in in and kind of control what you're doing without you knowing it, you know, and, and um, yeah, and I just had this really strong sense of um, like returning to nature and forgetting all the, all right. the bullshit, you know, like I was just like, and, and I was, um, and then, yeah, and like it was kind of spiritual because I sort of really, I got quite exhausted and then I ended up just going outside. I put a blanket down and I just lied in the sun, <laughs> just like, you know, and forgot about all this stuff. And because we can't solve, some of these problems are so big, you know, some of these complex things that Thomas Art talks about in those essays. It's just, it's huge, you know, and it's, um, it's interesting to the meta narratives and, and, you know, you can, you can get a wholeness, but then there's always other bits. <laughs> I, I like, it's just, uh, and, and with the, the way that we are in the world today, it seems to me like the only thing that I keep coming back to is the spiritual and nature. Yeah. That's yeah. all I've got. Like, like, that's all I've got to kind of, you know, like... Um, well, and that's the spirit of the depths that Dr. Jung was talking about. That is nature. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and yeah. And how to how to you know like, but but really getting in contact with that. Right. Not just as a mental construct as an idea, but at really how to, you know, how to be less mechanized and more in connection. Right. Um, and and so in the east. Um, there is, you know, a many millennium tradition of uh, meditation, okay? And, yeah. <clears throat> and even I attend a Tibetan Buddhist uh, meeting every week when we don't have coronavirus, where um, yeah. one of the things we do during that session is meditate. And um, because certain things go back and forth between the oh. people in that group um, that um, happen unconsciously, amazingly. But also it, for, it forces me, at least during that period, because everybody in the group is meditating, it forces me to physically stop and meditate in the traditional Tibetan Buddhist way, right? And what happens when you do that, when you meditate, is that you do get messages coming up from your unconscious that tell you what to yes. do, that tell you yes. what the answer is. And so the answer to all the craziness outside, no matter what it is, no matter what the political life of your country is, no matter where you are in your life in terms of life tasks, whether, you know, whether it's, um, you know, child rearing or uh, getting a job and building a family or whatever it is, all those things are very complex and they always have been. But if you can take yourself out of it for 15 minutes, even five minutes and just stop and just listen for a bit you will start to get messages. Now that's the significance of the Red Book because that's what Dr. Jung got. And he got huge wisdom coming out of his unconscious. And <clears throat> it, it begins um, 
with him calling for his soul. <clears throat> and he says, yes. he says, my, my soul, my soul, where have you been? How can I get in mm -hmm. touch with you? Okay. And he sat and he meditated for uh, 25 days and didn't hear anything. And finally, his soul started to respond to him. Okay. So when you're hearing voices in your mind saying, you shouldn't do this, you should probably listen because that, that is your soul. That is, that is your deep unconscious. That is yourself. That is this two million year old man communicating with you, telling you something that you need to know. I mean, for me, um, I'm very attuned to it because I'm so intuitive, but, um, but uh, for example, in the United States, we had a period of time where people would get radar detectors. So on the highway, um, you know, people would speed, go faster than the speed limit, and, but they could get a, uh, a detector for their car which would tell them if the police were using radar to catch speeders and it would go beep, 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 beep. And when they heard that, then they knew radar was around and they could slow down. Okay. And now I think those systems are banned in the U S but for me, I've never needed that because for me, anytime the police are doing anything near to me, um, I have a vision and it's the same vision every time. It's a vision of a police car driving from right to left across in front of my car. Okay, it's not physically there. It's only there in my psyche, but it's a vision that yeah. I get and it, and it pops up all the time, very frequently in my mind. And it, you know, this car says police on it. <clears throat> and I know I learned that I should immediately slow down. And what happens is within a minute or two, I will always see police activity. Okay, it doesn't matter what it, what, what it is. It could be a radar trap, but it, it could be something like um, a car accident on the other side of the road or down the road or any number of things that would involve the police. But every time I'm near the police, for whatever reason, I have this vision. Now, what is that vision doing? Well, it is realizing at an unconscious level things that I don't consciously see. Okay, so for example, on a highway, if I'm speeding, um, there might be people flashing their headlights coming the other way. I never notice it. I might not notice it consciously. Or the speed, the ongoing speed between our cars um, those coming toward me and my speed changes subtly, very subtly. And I don't notice it consciously, but myself, my two million year old man, wow, he gets it. And he sends me that message every time. Okay. And yeah. so, and so that's, that's instinct. That's mother nature that, you know, whatever you want to call it, but that's the part of us that we have to be in contact with. And so in this confusing world that you're talking about, or the confusing world that we're all in, because this is what this article is about, right? In this confusing world of our lives, we have to learn to stop and listen yeah. and pay attention to that two million year old man or the three and a half billion year old woman or whatever it is that mother nature has provided us okay we have it in our deep unconscious and we all have it and if we learn to listen to it and pay attention to it you know it's it's not always it, do, it doesn't always come out with a biblical passage for for example you have to be sensitive to the hints that it provides so, okay, I started to notice I was having this vision about the police very often. 
And I'm saying, well, yeah, what's that all about? You know, and at first I didn't even almost notice it. I just blow it off and keep going on with my life. But then I started to realize that it was correlated with what was going on in my physical life. And, and so that vision was yeah. coming from my unconscious and it was saying, pay attention here. <laughs> you know, the police are out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You might get a traffic ticket for speeding. <clears throat> and so those hints come to us in many different ways. They come to us through sight, sound, smells, you name it. Uh, they come to us and yeah and feelings uh, you know hairs on the back of our neck rising whatever it is those are the messages and and our dreams our dreams and visions are also messages you know mother nature doesn't waste time on bullshit okay so mother nature didn't get us to be able to physically talk to one another on opposite sides of the world um, by yeah. wasting time, okay? <laughs> what happened was, um, you know, all these ideas that have developed even long before human beings existed, um, you know, they're real. And they are messages that have been coming to creatures since time immemorial, you know, when when a uh, when you're in bed and all of a sudden you have a start, like you feel like you're falling out of bed, okay? Well, that's actually an instinct that comes from our great ape ancestors who were living in trees, okay? They were living in trees to be safe when they were asleep, and one of the things that would happen is you might roll off the limb and and fall to your death or fall to the lion <laughs> right and, and so it was a way to suddenly wake you up and have you grab the tree and fortunately for all of us um our ancestors were the ones that did successfully catch the tree because i'm sure lots of them didn't and they were eaten or they were yeah and they were eaten <laughs> simple as that and so so that that uh that falling out of bed thing comes from that among many other things yeah but, right and so mm. one of the things that i'm talking about here is that we have to learn to listen and that's the significance of dr young's red book and that's the significance of this essay and all the essays in this series that yeah. we have to learn to listen and to understand what <clears throat> these messages that come up from our deep unconscious mean. What, what does it really mean? Um, and so welcome, Lin Cha <laughs> you, you made it back, congratulations. <laughs> uh, so, um, so anyway, um, there, there are a couple of questions here that I should answer. Um, one is, what is your suggestion to us in terms of how we should do in order to find our meaning of life? And how do we be sure that it is the meaning of our life? I can't talk because I don't have a speaker, but I can hear if you can answer in the webinar, thank you for your class really enjoy it, although given my English limitation, by the way. Okay, so uh, so how do you find the meaning of your life? Okay, so I think we've been talking about it, haven't we, Nicole, where um, you simply have to start paying attention to your to yourself. Okay, the self is the deep, deepest part of the unconscious. And our ego is only a portion of it. And you need a connection with yourself, the, what's called the ego self axis in Jungian psychology. And I, th I think I have a, I think I have a, a visual that I can show you here if I'm lucky. Uh, all right, I think, is this it? No, this is it. Okay, 
let me share the screen for a moment. Okay, so when we're born, uh, when we're born, we're here, we're, we're inside the self and our ego has no consciousness whatsoever. And as we develop, we start to develop an ego. So with a child, um, a child typically will about age three say no to its mother, okay? And when the child says no, that means that child is developing an ego which is separate from the mother and not just totally overwhelmed by the mother. The child has a separate ego and so it says no, okay? Now gradually over your lifespan, your ego develops out of yourself. But what Dr. Jung was very significant, was very conscious of and was trying to express is that we need a, a connection between the ego and the self. So the ego is consciousness. Everything that you think consciously is part of your ego, but the self is what's keeping you alive, actually. Okay, the self tells your heart to beat 72 times a minute. It tells your lungs to breathe 12 times a minute. You never think about those things, or very rarely, but those things are going on in the background all the time, and they're keeping you alive. They replace all the trillions of cells in your body every seven years, with maybe with the exception of your bones. So yourself is doing all this stuff, okay? And yourself communicates with your ego, but it communicates in images because that communication developed eons before um, language was developed. And so it does it by images, by sending you a picture. And so that's what my story about the, the police car is. That's an image that myself sends me. Um, that's an image that myself sends me every single time that I um, ha get close to a police activity. It always happens. And so, um, so the point is, and Tim Holmes has joined us. So Tim, we're talking about the ego self axis here. And so the point is that the self is communicating to you through images. It might be through sound, it might be through a feeling, but it's, um, it communicates from the unconscious something that you weren't thinking about before. And when you have that communication, you should pay attention because it's important. The self is not telling you anything that's bullshit, okay? The self is doing things which it thinks you need to know in order to stay alive, very simply, that's what it's doing. And so the question is to pay attention to that. Now, in terms of this question, about meaning, um, I don't know what the meaning of your life is. I can't tell you that. Um, you have to find that out for yourself, but yourself, your deep unconscious is what's going to guide you toward that. And so even if you run into a roadblock, such as if you were an oak tree and one limb got cut off, you're not dead, the oak tree isn't dead, it just pushes out a branch in another direction. So if you lose your right arm and you were right-handed, well, I guess yourself is gonna teach you how to write with your left hand, right? Um, and it will do that. As long as you still have your life, um, it will create another way of working around. I mean, as as you know, I've learned and I actually have these eye patches now, although I'm not using them yet. Uh, but, um, you know, what I learned, if I'm seeing double on the computer, uh, so, okay, I have to wear an eye patch. Now I can see more clearly. If 
because I'm not seeing double and I can wear one on this side and then I can wear one on this side and I can adjust to the fact that I see double by covering one eye. Um, and so our self is always making that adjustment. I mean, there's a great example. They did an experiment at the Naval Academy where, um, where they had a, a kind of glasses that allowed you to, that reversed everything. So whatever you saw through the glasses was actually upside down, okay? Literally upside down. That's what these glasses would do for you. And they found that within five hours, five hours, the psyche would adjust for that. And you would start seeing everything as right side up, even though it was actually being presented to you upside down. And, and, uh, and so yourself is going to tell you what the meaning of your life is. I can't tell you that because I don't know who you are, where you live, what restrictions you face, whatever they are. Uh, I can't tell you that, but yourself can tell you based on what the assets available to you are, what you can do with, with your life. And, you know, so if an oak tree is in a place that's poisoned soil, <laughs> you know, maybe it can send roots out, out to an area where there's not poisoned soil, where, where it won't die, you know. So that's sort of what we're doing here in a sense, right? So uh, I guess that's all. Hi, hi, Tim. You you missed all the fun. Oh gosh, I'm I'm so sorry. Hi, how are you? <laughs> it's early for you. Um, I've, I'm so confused about the schedule. I've got all these different uh, groups that I'm that I'm trying to negotiate or to coordinate with and just keeping track of the schedule is just beyond me right. so i've got all these things on my calendar and then i think my gosh i'm, I'm sure that skip had something going on today but right i so, couldn't find any i couldn't so, find any information so so um tim i'm being careful about uh who this session is communicating with but if you will look in the chat um if you will look in the chat and go up and down in the chat so you see it all, then you'll have a pretty clear idea of who this session is really trying to reach, okay? I don't and see anything in the chat. You don't see anything in the chat? Nothing. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe because you came lot late. Uh, but let me, I, I, let me give you a hint here. I'm going to share my screen again, and uh, this will give you a hint. Okay, so there's my hint. Okay, that, that's enough of a hint. Um, so you either get it or you don't. <laughs> and and so anyway, um, this, is, this is a class in which I'm going through um, Dr. Arst's essay from Jung's Red Book from our time, for our time. So I've been reading from Jung's Red Book for our time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, edited by Mary Stein and Thomas Arst, in part as a memoriam to Dr. Arst. And I've been going through his essay paragraph by paragraph. So we've gotten through uh, the first five pages or so. There's a lot of material in there. And um, I'll be doing this every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. Uh, because it's 8 p.m. in Singapore, so it's a little easier for people in Singapore and people like Nicole, who's in Australia. But even for Nicole, it's now getting late because <laughs> it's after after midnight for Nicole now. But but anyway, it's aimed at that side of the world. So um, 
Cool. So anyway, I'm going to discontinue for today. I hope this has been useful okay. um, for everybody that is following it. I'm going to put my email address here and uh, you're free to write to me more about this and about the effort. And, uh, and I would hope that in future weeks, uh, I've, I've set it so that the, the link and the password will be the same for four weeks. And so um, I hope that it, it won't change, but sometimes it does change. So um, be in touch with me by email if you want to be here on this session every week. And I, I'm going to keep it very basic uh, on Jungian psychology, just the fundamentals uh, for the foreseeable future. And so it's designed, the idea of what I'm doing is to be for a basic understanding of what Dr. Jung was about and what these issues are about. And, you know, I hope it's helpful. And so anyway, so Tim, I really appreciate you stopping by, uh, but, yeah. but I've already been at it for three hours. Uh, <laughs> I've been at it for three hours, so I'm going to cut it off for now, but uh, we'll do it. We'll do it again sometime soon. Okay. So, Thank you, Skip. And, and so you're quite welcome. I'm glad you were all here. <laughs> And please do encourage your friends and colleagues to join us in future weeks. So every week at, on yeah. Sunday at 8 a.m. my time. Um, and this link. And hopefully this link. But if I have your email address, I will send you also notice about it. Um, and so, Tim, I, I don't know if you'll want to come every Sunday morning because it'll be 6 in the morning for you. but. Uh, but anyway. I have I have a few gestalt therapists that I'm in contact with that might be interested. Okay, that'd be great. It'd be great to have yeah, some I'm others. Yeah, it'd be great to have some others because uh, Nicole, what we found is that uh, our friends in another place that this is aimed actually to, um, they yeah. can. They can read. They can see a Zoom conference, but once the live stream is over, they can't see the playback. Okay, and right. I'm encouraging everybody if you can to record um, on your end, and I will give you permission to record if you are able to do that. Um, yeah. But anyway, I see a, a hand raised by Simon. Simon, do you want to say something before we? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just, just time is uh, limited, so I just uh, show my respect to the people like you who are concentrate on psychological works. And uh, before I'm a patient uh, of uh, Miss Lin, I got very bad uh, depression, uh -huh. and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, he, she help, helps me a lot. And, uh, before, I didn't know uh, until someday she told me, you got uh, uh, psychological and uh, 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 mentally and uh, physically depression. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, it make, make me clear. I, I think the, the psychological is uh, that kind of work. It uh, make people see the real thing. Mm -hmm. So, so I uh, show my respect uh, to all of you who work on psychological uh, theories. <laughs> and yeah. uh, uh, okay, and uh, for me, I have some, yeah, yeah, some, uh, some questions not. Uh, close to the topic, but uh, uh, just now, I think you talk uh, about uh, uh, 
handicapped people, with blind people and uh, and uh, deaf people like like uh, like that. I think um, the, the the existence you you just said is existence before in cycle. So I think that uh, that kind of people is uh, that they uh, uh, they give healthy people chance to help them. That is a part of their value and uh, True. make yeah make people make healthy people really show their love ability. Yeah, I think like that yeah. because uh, that because. There's an old saying in China, uh, very well, well, well spread. I think it's very bad. It's, it's bad. It's very bad history. It's very bad uh, old saying. It tells uh, people who are pitiful sure. must, m must have their detestable. That, uh, that, that, that saying cut off the sympathy of people. Yeah. I think so. So, so that's not uh, only the problem in China. It's among the, the world, I think. Really? So, yeah, yeah. So, so, so um, I think, I think like, uh, so you, you people who work on psychological are great. Oh, thank you, you. You, 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 you make people uh, whole, <laughs> holy, holy. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, so, uh, yeah, so, you know, that is the point that, you know, nobody can change the facts of your individual life, whatever they are, okay, mm -hmm. wherever you live. But the point is that we could there could be a child in Somalia who's starving to death and whose ribs are showing right now, that if that mm. child were nourished mm. and, and then able to grow up properly in some way, that child could cure cancer. We don't know who can cure cancer. Okay. Mm. It could be any person. Okay. It mm. could be a blind person. It could be a person like Helen Keller who can't see and who couldn't see and she couldn't hear, but because she had a teacher that could interact with her and get her to interact with the world, uh, you know, she did in fact become a, a great public speaker and a, and a great writer in her lifetime. Um, and and so the point is that any of us, regardless of where we live or what our handicaps are, can uh, make a contribution to life and leave an important tile behind um, in the great mosaic of life. And we just don't know who it is. I mean, it, it might be you, it might be uh, Lin Chia it could be uh, Nicole or Tim. Each one of us bring, brings our tile to the party and we have to place it into the mosaic. And maybe some of us bring more than one tile, but, but the point is that everybody has the possibility of doing that. And we don't know who is gonna cure cancer. It could be that starving mm. child in Somalia, right? Or wherever. Mm -hmm. I, mm. And, and so if we learn, um, um, you know, as the Dalai Lama says, my religion is basic human kindness. Um, yeah. You know, that's, uh, that's very powerful. Um, and uh, by the way, Tim, that, that um, link that I sent you um, only works today. Okay, mm. it's not going to be available after today. Okay, so you'll send us a new link for the future? Say it again. 
You'll send you'll send more links for the future. No, I don't mean the link to this. I'm, I sent you a link about the Dalai, the film of the Dalai Lama. Oh yes, I got that. Right. That, but that link will only work today, because that right. was that's a forty-eight hour premiere uh, that was granted to that one group, and and so if you don't use it today, it's going to go away. No, I I registered already. Okay, so now you have to also watch before midnight. Uh, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> okay, yeah. so every everyone, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate it. Um, Nicole, thank I will you. I will send you that link. It's a um, it's a link to a, a film. Um, oh, okay, thanks. But it's only That's good right. until midnight tonight, U.S. time. Oh. So you would oh, yeah. you would have to watch it tomorrow morning if you wanted to watch right. it. Okay. Okay. And um, thanks very much for that, Skip. It just looks amazing to me. Oh, it is amazing. That is an amazing film. And Deb and I sat and watched it, and we were totally enthralled by it. But anyway, uh, so that'll be forthcoming. And um, nice seeing everybody. I'll be back here uh, next week at the same time, 8 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 8 p.m. Singapore Time, and 10 p.m. Sydney Time. <laughs> Sorry about that. So peace to